Ever get that feeling, you know, when you're looking at your soldiers, maybe brand new privates, fresh out of basic, and they just expect you to know everything. Oh, yeah. Like you should have all the answers. Well, today we're diving deep into the Army's leadership manual, ADP 622, Chapter 5, Leads Others, they call it. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, this one's packed with some pretty solid tools to help tackle that feeling head on. You know, it's funny you should say that because this chapter, it kicks off with a quote right from General Omar Bradley, and it kind of nails that feeling perfectly. He said, soldiers, they don't want to be led to death. They want to be led to win. Oh, They're yeah. looking at you to get the job done, mm. get it done right without any unnecessary risk. And they expect you as their leader to teach them to do the same. Yeah. Talk about pressure. No kidding, right? It's a lot. Yeah. And I guess that's where ADP 622 comes in. Exactly. It's like the Army's playbook okay. for leadership. Yeah. This chapter really breaks down what leading others like effectively really means. Oh. Practical skills. You can use them every day, no matter your rank. Oh, I like that. Regardless of your rank. So not just for you know senior leaders or anything. It's for everybody. Absolutely. It lays out five core competencies. Influencing others, extending your influence, building trust, leading by example, communication. Okay. Those all sound pretty important, I have to say. They are. But here's the thing. They aren't just like boxes to check off. You know what I mean? How you actually apply these things, it changes. Depends yeah. on your role in the situation. A squad leader, they're going to approach influence a lot differently than, say, a battalion commander, right? Right. Of course. Yeah. Makes sense. Different levels, different playing fields. So it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of approach. Not at all. So speaking of influence, I noticed the chapter really dives deep into that concept. What makes it so critical, especially in the Army? It really boils down to this. You can't lead without influence. That's right. Think about it. Every single soldier, from the newest private to the four-star general, right? Mm -hmm. They have to lead and they have to follow at some point. Yeah. Influence. That's the sweet spot, you know, mm -hmm. where you inspire action, get real commitment, not just demanding blind obedience. Right, right. Because you can tell someone to do something, but that doesn't mean they're going to do it well or, you know, with any kind of enthusiasm. Exactly. And that's where the art of it comes in. It's like that story in the chapter. But the first sergeant. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. They get the guidance from the commander. So they're in the follower role there. But then... they got to turn around. They've got to relay that to their platoon sergeants. Right. In a way that those sergeants can then use to motivate their teams. Mm -hmm. It's not about just giving orders. It's about, like you said, adapting to the situation. Right. It is. It's about getting everybody on board, moving towards that same objective. Teamwork. Exactly. Teamwork. Now, doesn't mean you got to be best buddies with everyone you lead. Right. The chapter, it makes a really important distinction. Okay. Between compliance and commitment. Oh, interesting. And when each one's necessary. Okay. I'm intrigued. Break that down for me. What's the difference and why should a leader even care? So compliance versus commitment. I feel like I'm back in some leadership class at Knox, you know. <laughs> ah, the memories. Right. Refresh my memory, though. What's the difference here? Why does it even matter? Okay, think of it this way. Compliance is like following the speed limit. Okay. Because you don't want a ticket, right? You're doing the bare minimum, the absolute minimum. Right. But commitment, that's more like, you know, you got to hit the gas. There's a medical emergency. Okay. You're all in going above and beyond because you get it. You believe in the mission. That's a great analogy. Actually, yeah. I like that. So as a leader, then, how do you figure out when to push for one over the other? I mean, you can't give some big inspirational speech about dental hygiene, right? Well, you could Trey Rye. Right. But yeah, you're right. It's all about reading the situation. The manual, it uses that example, getting your yearly flu shot. Okay. Probably going to be a compliance situation. It's an order. Got to get it done. But then it talks about taking a heavily fortified enemy position. Mm. Whoa, that's different. Yeah, a little bit different. Yeah. That needs a whole other level of buy-in. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to need every single ounce of commitment and initiative from your soldiers to pull that off. Mm -hmm. So how do you even cultivate that? I mean, do you just tell everyone to believe in the mission and hope for the best? If only or that easy, right? Remember those five competencies we talked about? Yeah. They all play a part. They work together. Leading by example. That's a big one. Okay. Your soldiers, they are watching you. If you're out there working just as hard as they are, showing them that you believe in what you're doing, it catches on. Right. It's contagious. Exactly. It builds trust. And then that trust, well, it fuels commitment. It's like that saying, um, 
people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Something like that. 100%. Showing genuine care for your soldiers, for their well-being, for their development, that's huge. And it actually ties into another point the manual makes. It's that you got to recognize everyone's got different motivators. Oh, interesting. What really inspires one soldier might not do a thing for another. So it's not enough to just have your one leadership style and expect everyone to, you know, fall in line? Nope. Got to be adaptable. And that is where, you know, those nine methods of influence come in. Right. It's like different tools in your in your leadership toolbox, you know? Uh, nine methods, though. That's a lot. Yeah. Can you give me the rundown on just a few that you really connect with? Sure. So we touched on pressure before, mm. right? Mm. Essential when you've got a time-sensitive situation, absolutely. But you use it sparingly. Okay. Overuse it. You risk... Well, you risk morale. You risk trust. Makes sense. Collaboration. That's another big one, especially as you move up, you know, in the ranks. Right. It's all about getting your team involved in the decision making, tapping into their expertise, making them feel like they own it, you know. Huh. Yeah, because nobody likes to feel like they're just, you know, following orders blindly, right? Exactly. People want to feel heard. When people feel valued, they're way more likely to be committed to whatever the mission is. Right. Makes sense. Then you got inspirational appeals. That's about those shared values, tapping into purpose, emotions even. Okay. That one sounds a little, I don't know, touchy-feely for the Army, doesn't it? Maybe on the surface. But remember, you're dealing with people, humans. That's true. And emotions. They're a powerful motivator. Yeah, I guess so. Think about it, those moments in history when you had those amazing leaders rallying their troops, those big speeches before a battle. Right. It's connecting on a deeper level, right? It's about reminding everybody what's at stake, why their sacrifices they matter. It makes sense. But like with pressure, though, I imagine timing is key. You can't go around giving some grand emotional speech every time you just need someone to, like, you know, refill the coffee pot. Huh. No, you're right. It's all about reading the room. Understanding your audience, choosing the right tool for that job. Right. So like having a whole toolbox. Exactly. Now, one method, I think it deserves some extra attention, especially now in today's army, extending influence beyond the chain of command. Yeah, that one really jumped out at me, too, when I was reading through the chapter. What does that even look like in action? Extending influence beyond the chain of command. Yeah. It feels like that's where leadership goes beyond just your unit you know, into something much bigger. Oh, absolutely. Think about deployments today, right? You've got multinational forces, civilian organizations, local populations, you name it. It's a lot. It's a whole different ballgame. It is. You could be a platoon leader, right? Andre. But even your interaction with, say, a village elder, that could make or break the entire mission. Wow. That's a lot of pressure. Knowing something as simple as a conversation could have those ripple effects. How do you even begin to navigate that effectively? It really starts with understanding that influence in this context, it's less about your rank. And it's more about building those bridges, you know? Building relationships. Exactly. And cultural sensitivity. That's key. The manual, it gives this example of a young soldier. I think he was a private, actually. Okay. And he just used, like, his basic knowledge of the local customs, and he was able to diffuse this whole tense situation at a checkpoint. Wow. Small actions, big impact. Yeah, that's incredible. So it's about building trust, rapport, even when you have like totally different backgrounds, you know? Totally. And that requires strong communication skills, which, you know, conveniently is our next competency. Right, right. Of yeah. course. Yeah, it always comes back to that. The manual is really big on emphasizing that communication. It's more than just giving orders, you know? Right. It's not just barking orders. It's about making sure everybody is on the same page. They get it. Creating that shared understanding. Yeah. And that takes effort. For sure, especially now when so much is, you know, text, email, quick message. Oh, I know. It's so easy to have things get misinterpreted, you know, when you don't have, like, the tone of voice, body language, all that stuff that adds context. Exactly. The manual really stresses how important face-to-face -face is sure. whenever possible, especially for those big, important conversations. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. You can't exactly build trust with a PowerPoint, right? Nope. Speaking of trust, we've got to talk about leading by example. That one seems so simple in theory. Right. But it's got to be more than just, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Exactly. Your soldiers, they're always watching you. Even when you think they're not, they are. They see how you handle the pressure, how you treat other people. If you hold yourself to the same standard you expect of them. Yeah. It's about living those army values, you know. 
loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage, all of them, every single day. It's like that saying, character is who you are when no one's watching. <laughs> Something like that. Nailed it. It's so true. And speaking of character, the manual really hones in on like leading with confidence in adverse conditions. Big one. Yeah, because I mean, anybody can look like a leader when everything's, you know, going great, right? Exactly. They, it's yeah. when you're facing those challenges, the setbacks, yeah. even danger, you know, mm -hmm. that's when you see true leadership. That's when it matters. That's when it counts. And your soldiers, they take their cues from you. Mm -hmm. You panic, they panic. But if you can keep your cool, make those smart decisions under pressure, that is huge. They make or break the situation. Absolutely. It's like that example they give about the DA civilian yeah, yeah. overseas equipment testing, I think it was. Right. And they had to have the, I don't know, the guts, the moral courage to stand by their call, even when there was pressure to just, you know, pass something that wasn't safe. They put their integrity, the well-being of other soldiers above their own career. Powerful stuff. And it really drives home that leadership. It's not a, about your rank. It's not about your position. It's about doing the right thing, especially when it's hard. 100%. Oh, we've covered a lot of ground today, that's for sure. What are some key takeaways you'd want listeners to, I don't know, walk away with from this deep dive into ADP 622? First off, leadership. It's not a checklist, you know, it's not a destination. It's a journey. It's something you keep learning, you keep growing. And this chapter, it's got some fantastic tools for your toolkit along the way. The second thing, leadership, it's about people. It's about building that trust, making sure you're communicating so people really get you, understanding what makes them tick. That's how you succeed. And sometimes, you know, it's about having the courage to go your own way. Mm -hmm. Right. To stand up for what's right, even when it's not the easy thing to do. Yeah. Just like General Eisenhower did on D-Day. Man, his message to those troops that day. That's a perfect example of so much of what we've talked about today. Clear purpose, total confidence and just, you know, the deep care he had for those soldiers. It's that powerful reminder that even with all the odds stacked against you, real leadership can achieve incredible things. Well said. This deep dive has been awesome. A good reminder that leadership is always evolving. And this ADP, it's a variable tool. It really is for anyone and everyone who wants to step up their game. To up their game, yeah. Well, on that note, I think we'll wrap up our deep dive for today on ADP 622. Remember, folks, leadership is a journey, not a destination. Every interaction, every single challenge. That's a chance to learn and grow. Until next time.